Good morning, guys. Welcome to Fishbowl Thinker. I'm Chad Lachance, and I appreciate you joining us. Now, you've got me taking a break right here on the side of the beautiful Cash Laputa River here in North Colorado. Uh, we've been out fishing all morning. We've had a great time. And over the course of the morning, it occurred to us that there were some fundamental things about spin fishing in the river that we thought you guys would like to know. So we're going to put a whole show together here that's talking about working the three most important things that we feel like that, a, that an angler needs to know as far as presentations if there are spin fish in the river. We're going to talk about jigs. We're going to talk about little hard plugs, and we're going to talk about inline spinners. So stay tuned, get comfortable. This is going to be a really informative show. Fishful Thinker Television is brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter. Peterson Toyota and Toyota Trucks, moving forward. St. Croix Rod, best rods on earth. Berkeley, catch more fish. Abu Garcia, for life. Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors and Colorado Parks and Wildlife. As the same as if we're spin fishing anywhere else, I almost always carry multiple rods, typically two or sometimes three. And the reason is this, different lengths, different powers, and possibly different actions as well. My actions all tend to be fast action, meaning that the rod bends at the very tip of the rod more than anywhere else. So a truly fast action rod bends down here at this end at the very tip of the rod, but has a little more meat or a little more beef or power, whatever you want to call it, through the middle of the rod right here. I couple that with fast to extra fast reel, something 5.8, or more and as far as the gear ratio and almost always we've got either Nanofill or we've got some sort of a light fluorocarbon, typically a fluorocarbon XL. In Nanofill's case it's going to be somewhere between four and eight pound in most scenarios and if we look at the fluorocarbon it's going to be between about four and six pound in most scenarios. Nanofill doesn't care about torsional rigidity, it doesn't care about twist, it doesn't care a whole lot about how light the lure is, so I really love the Nanofill from that standpoint. You know, you notice that both these rods match right here. I've got a St. Croix Trout Series rod in both hands. The difference in the two is one's a seven foot light and the other one's a six foot ultra light as far as the power goes. The ultra light, I've got the Nanofill and it's set up for the smallest lures I'm gonna throw. The light powered rod has got a little more backbone to it and, uh, and it's got the fluorocarbon on it and that's the one I'll probably do the bulk of my jigging with. So these two are the minimum that I carry. If I'm going to a bigger river somewhere, I'll step up to a, to a medium light as well, a little bit more power and that's because I'll throw a a little bit bigger lures. The, when St. Croix designed the Trout Series rods, a couple of key design features came into play and it's why we use them in the river a lot. First of all, they're very lightweight and that's important because we're talking a lot of times about relatively small fish. If you're going brook trout fishing, a very small reactive rod's a lot of fun. The other thing about the Trout Series rods I already kind of alluded to, the tips of them are very light so that you can throw real light lures really quickly, but they're a little bit more beefy through the backbone than some, some other general use fishing rods because trout live in current. So in a lot of cases, you're gonna hook trout in water and he's gonna pull you in a current. You need a little bit more backbone to get him out of there. So the Trout Series rods were designed specifically for throwing lures in running water for trout. They're very light. I tend to pair them with a size 10 Abu Garcia reel. Fishful Thinker Television is brought to you by Ranger Boats, still building legends one at a time. Evan Rood, spend more time on the water. Lawrence, find, navigate, dominate. All right, enough with the generalities. Let's start talking about some specific presentations. And the three that I already mentioned, I think you need to be good with a jig. I think you need to be good with a hard plug. And I think you need to be good with an inline spinner. If you've got those three things mastered, possibly a spoon as well, you can cover whatever you need to cover as far as rivers go. And I don't care if you're fishing in, in California, Montana, or Colorado, a freestone stream is a freestone stream. And those things will get you bit one way or the other. A couple other quick generalities. The slower the water is, the faster I tend to fish. The faster the water is, the slower I tend to fish. And the reason being is fish get a better chance to look at your lure in the real calm waters. The reason trout are so hard to trick in something like a classic uh, you know, meadow type stream or real slow frog waters, they can really, really examine your fly or your lure. So when I get in that situation, I want that lure to be so fast that the trout have no chance to really look at it. They have to chase it down and grab it. 
Conversely, in the fast water like this, they may be very focused on what's going on directly in front of them, and the, the, you can work a little bit more methodically to let them a chance to notice a bait and go over and get it. And so they don't inspect it so much as they just grab it because the opportunity will be lost in a hurry if they don't. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. It doesn't matter what bait we talk about going forward, casting angles are gonna make all the difference, and we'll talk about that with each specific bait. Okay, we'll keep working different angles here. Whole deal with this little spinner is just keep different angles, presenting it at slightly different angles and different speeds and little pauses and little pops. Just some way to mix it up ever so slightly. So the first presentation we feel like that you really ought to be good with is probably the most classic of everything we're going to talk about, and that's the inline spinner. This is a little Johnson minnow spin right here. Uh, it happens to be an eighth of an ounce one. They're made all the way down, I believe, to a 32nd, at least a 24th of an ounce. That's the smallest I have with me. The beauty of an inline spinner is this little blade right here goes round and round and round, just like it sounds like. That creates flash, that creates vibration. If you notice on this one, it's got chrome on one side and color on the other that flash and the vibration that that thing puts off allows trout to locate this lure easily. So if I'm in heavy running water, if I've got a little stain in the water, uh, that's when I'm typically gonna reach for the inline spinner. The other thing about the inline spinner is it's the one that works best in real flat water because it's the fastest of them as well. So if I'm gonna work across riffles, say rainbows that are staged on real, real flat water in the middle of summertime, I can really burn the inline spinner across there and be confident that they're gonna chase it down and grab it. Inline spinners will create a potential for line twist. One of the things I like best about the Johnson minnow spin right here is that it's very good about riding upright. If you notice, it's kind of keel shaped. It rides upright more often than not, and it doesn't create near the twist that some of the more um, older school brands of, of inline spinners will create. I tend to throw the, the inline spinners as heavy as I could get away with because I like the speed. This is not a bait I typically like to work very slow because of that churning blade. Trout are real cognizant of where it's at. But if you watch some of the stuff with the inline spinners, it all comes down to casting angle and speed a lot of the time. The bait hits the water, you close the bail, come tight, give it a little snap of the rod tip to get the blade started, and then just let the thing come across the current. It looks like it's swimming and it's a great way to get a ton of bites. And the beauty of a spinner, I mean, you can just retrieve it. You don't, you don't have to do a lot with it. You can use the current. Um, I'll steer it with the rod. I'm gonna vary up my speed quite a bit. I caught a leap that time. I'm gonna vary up my speed quite a bit. And the reason is that will change my depth. So the faster I retrieve it, the higher in the water column it will run. And so I can mix up my depth. And we always talk about depth range. The beauty of an inline spinner as well is it has a very high hookup ratio. Because it's got a small hook hanging on the back of there, whether you do or don't remove the barbs on them is up to you. But that little bait, that little hook hanging on the back of there is the first thing the trout are gonna get a hold of. That's why many manufacturers put some sort of a little feather on the back to get their attention. Um, fantastic little bait with the inline spinners. I tend to work them 45, either 90 degrees across to 45 degrees downstream, meaning that I'm throwing it straight across the current and retrieving it, or I'm throwing it 45 downstream and retrieving it that way, or letting it swing in the current like a fly guy might do with a streamer. Either way, the inline spinners are great, great, great bait. They're affordable, they're easy to throw. Inline spinner is a fantastic little bait for a variety of things. The inline spinner, in my mind, is the fastest bait. It's the most efficient bait for working riffles. It's a fantastic bait in runoff situations as well. We got basically what amounts to frog water here. We got water that's real flat, nothing to it. Spinners excel in that situation, inline spinners, because I can literally just burn them across here and cover a lot of water in a hurry and hope to find any little subtle changes in the bottom in this kind of water. Fishful Thinker Television is brought to you by Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors. Peterson Toyota and Toyota Trucks, moving forward. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So my next favorite after the inline spinner is without question a little hard plug of some sort. This is a number four uh, Berkeley Flicker Shad, one of my absolute favorites in the river. If you notice, first thing, it's got a diving lip on it. Why is that important? Well, because a lot of time when you get in freestone rivers, you're gonna have deep runs and deep holes, and this bait will dive to the bottom and swim naturally when it gets down there. So a hard bait of some sort could be like that. It could be like this little 
uh, slow sinking minnow plug right here as well, but something in the two to three inch range, uh, great, great, great way to catch a whole bunch of trout in the river. As with the inline spinner, I tend to throw them across current or 45 degrees down current more often than not. When I start retrieving a hard plug or an inline spinner towards the fish, in other words, into their face, we don't catch as many of them. Ideally, with either one of the moving baits, I'd really like to see it come into their peripheral vision. So if the fish is facing this way, I want the plug to come this way or swing across in front of them, not attack them from the front. Really the biggest key is getting the fish to notice it and then run from him and that's an important part. Almost always we work those baits very quickly. We do not give the fish a chance to look at them. Uh, I may swing it across the current, across in front of them and, and that's probably the slowest retrieve you're going to see. Typically it's going to be tipped down with lots of action on the rod. Almost nobody throws something like a true crankbait like this flicker shad that I'm throwing right here. I mean. This bait's really a bait designed for things like white bass and smallmouth bass and walleyes, but I've got a real deep section of the river right here and lots of current. So it's a prime situation for getting a bait down deep into the water column by using the diving lip on it. And one thing I know as well as I know my own name, trout love to eat fish. Come on, fish. There's one, got him, there we go. Oh, gee zooks, that's a big one. <laughs> Look at the bow in that rod, guys. That's why we like the ultralight fishing. The drag set real soft to protect the line. Come on out of the current, out of the current. There you go, dude, there you go. Come here, there, right, beautiful. Hooked on the tail hook right in the corner of the mouth. So it's a beautiful fish, and with the ultralight, I mean, you look at this little rod, it's rated for, what's this rod rated for? 1 32nd of an ounce, all the way to 3 16 That right there, bait right there, is on the top end of that range, and uh, beautiful brownie, and see, he's not, he can get all of his wits about him. We'll go ahead and let him go. If somebody says, Chad, you have to fish one lure the rest of your life on spinning tackle for a trout, it is without question a jig. And ironically, that same question could apply to any species in the world. But in the river for trout, it's so hard to beat a little straight minnow plug, or excuse me, a straight little minnow body like this is just very, very hard to beat. Trout eat bugs. Everybody knows trout eat bugs, but trout are major piscivores as well. They eat fish as well. There's not a tremendous volume of small fish in the rivers, typically baby trout, maybe sculpin, maybe dace, and maybe little suckers. But the reality is if they get spotted by a big trout, they're going to get eaten. And a little jig is very hard to beat in that regard. The beauty of the jig is I can fish it high in the water column, low in the water column. I can work that one straight downstream, which we don't tend to have very much success with, with the other baits we talked about. I can work it straight upstream. I can hold it in the current, just let it sit there. And here's the funny part. If they bite it, because it's made out of rubber, whether it's scented or otherwise, they'll typically bite it several times if you miss a hook set. So it doesn't give them any negative cues. It's a soft piece of rubber. As far as they know, lunch got away. So working the bait right back to them in a lot of cases will get the fish to come right back with the same one you just threw. That's very important. There's one right there. Okay, that's a little guy. Now that figures right there, guys. The biggest bait I've thrown all day in terms of of jigs go anyway, and it's the smallest fish we've caught all day. Goes to show you. But uh, I knew we'd catch one in that seam over there. I mean, that's just too good looking of a spot. And this, I believe, is our smallest fish of the day. So we'll be real quick about him. My hand's wet. And you can see that jig buried right in the tip of his nose right there. A little unscented jig. How nice is that? Hey, buddy. Another real common one for me uh, when it comes to working uh, jigs in the river is some sort of a little marabou jig. This is a little Johnson Beetle Boo in black. Uh, I love to throw a white one with a pink head on it or an orange head on it uh, or just a pure white one. And what I'm figuring out is that they're right on the bottom. And so by doing that, you notice how I was just working that jig super slow. And there you go, guys. There's a perfect Arkansas River Brown with a marabou jig right in the corner of his face and look at that guys we should catch lots and lots of these today we'll get him put back real quick there you go bud and I'll show you my little jig so it's a little Johnson beatable marabou jig right there if you really look at it if there's fly guys in the crowd watching you look at this 
it's a woolly bugger without hackle on it. It's marabou in the back, chenille on the body, and instead of a bead, it's got a little jig head and a 90 degree hook. All right, the other thing that I look at when it comes to jigs is a little tube jig right here. You got a little Johnson tube, uh, a little crappie tube. Tube jigs, uh, basically my whole arsenal consists of these four jigs. 99% of the time, if I'm trout fishing right there, a straight minnow body, a tube jig, a marabou jig, or some sort of a little crayfish looking crawdad jig like this. This is, they, they, they call it a power nymph, but it kind of looks crawdaddy to me. Uh, the bottom line is this, if I have these four jigs right here, I can cover wherever I need to go. Now, if I went to a great big river, like say the Madison River, or one of the big giant bighorn rivers, I would take the same thing and just upsize it for the size of the water. We're here on the Poudre River, you can see the flows are relatively low. I have a selection of smaller jigs with me today. Same as with the other baits, the, the smaller the water, the smaller the jig. It has nothing to do with the size of the fish. Some of the biggest trout I've ever caught have bit the little tiny jig, and conversely, I've caught some little tiny trout and some great big jigs. Fishful Thinker Television is brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter. St. Croix Rod, best rods on earth. Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors. If I take a plug and I reel it, it's got built-in action. If I take an inline spinner and I reel it, it's got built-in action. If I take the jig and reel it, it just comes straight to me with almost no action at all. The key to the jig is going to be how you hold the rod and how you work the rod. And when I say how do you hold the rod, I'm saying really in reference to where's the tip. Is the tip down on the surface of the water? Are you working it tip down? Are you working it tip up? Are you working it horizontal like this? With the jig, the more tip up you work it, the more vertical the bait tends to move up and down. The more tip down, the more horizontal the bait tends to work. So that's the key thing to it right there. The other thing about it is you create more lift on the jig when the rod tips higher you, so you don't snag as many of them. So if you're on big bouldery freestone where snagging is an issue, a real high tip will prevent you from snagging the jig nearly as much. If I'm on a gravel bottom, I might literally put the jig on the bottom and all but drag it like a little minnow scooting along the bottom, or certainly with the little Berkeley Power Nymph, I might drag that thing straight on the bottom as well. Seems like so many times just steering your bait, you know, move rod tip over this way and then steer it back that way just enough to get the, the bait to kind of change direction, just give it a little tiny change in speed when you do that can make such a difference as far as triggering bites goes. A lot of our bites come right on those little direction changes where you go from over here to over here and the bait just kind of makes one quick angle change. You know, it's not a huge difference, but it's enough. I tend to pop the jigs and hop the jigs more than anything else. Sometimes we'll give them a light swim, a little horizontal where they'll pop and kind of glide, but I tend to work the jig up and down more than anything else in the river. And it doesn't matter whether I'm on the bank or, or if I'm you know, in a drift boat, that very vertical up and down pop on the jig is really what gets trout excited. Big giant plunge pools, one of my favorite places to fish. That is, without question, jig water. The, the, the bait needs to go straight to the bottom as fast as possible, and then you need to work it vertically. That's how you're gonna get more of them to bite, snapping that bait along. So when I'm working plunge pools, you cannot beat the jig. All right, and that's why we fished the pocket water, guys. I had to rotate through a couple jigs and get a much heavier one. And once I did that, ta-da! Perfect brown trout, and I'm kind of in a precarious spot here. Let me get turned around, I'll show them to you guys. My little unscented tube jig, little Johnson crappie tube, and we'll put him back down in the water. And it's fray bit like we've shown you in a lot of shows. Uh, no problem as far as the fish goes. He can stay in the water. There you go, guys. Perfect little Poudre River brown trout. And we'll put him back in the hole right here and let him go back. But if you look at this water behind me, it's a beautiful run. The problem is you got to come straight down off the hill to get here. And it's a long ways down here. But with the water this heavy, not that many guys really come fish it. And uh, because of that, we feel like it's a good opportunity. So I've got a very heavy little Johnson crappie tube right there, but I've got it on an eighth ounce, even though it's only an inch and a half long. The reason is it bombs straight to the bottom in here. And that's important when you're fishing these real plunge pools. You don't have, these fish live deep in these pools. They don't live high in the water column. So you got to get down to the bottom. And that's how we picked that one off right there. So we'll keep fishing, see if we can get some more of them. 
What water do I look for most commonly for inline spinner? I tend to throw it most in riffles. I want relatively flat bottoms. I don't want a lot of bottom contour, and I certainly don't want a tremendous amount of depth. Now, as I said, guys, everything I carry, I'm gonna be on the river all day today, everything I carry fits in this box. So I don't carry a tremendous amount of stuff, and that's one of the be beauties of spin fishing in the rivers. You don't have to carry a lot of stuff. One thing I do carry a fair variety of is jig heads. Um, they're gonna range somewhere between a 32nd of an ounce and an eighth of an ounce in most scenarios in river of this size. If I get in a great big river like the Colorado River, I might be up in a quarter, uh, maybe even a little bit more than that if I get some really big water. So I carry a couple of each jig heads each anytime I'm in the river. I carry a couple colors of bodies, a couple colors of hard plugs, and a couple of colors and sizes of inline spinners, and that's it. It makes life very easy on me as an angler to travel light, which is good because a lot of times fishing the river involves hiking as well. All right, guys, so there you have it. The fundamentals of spin fishing in the river in a nutshell. You know, casting angle is very important. Rod tip high, rod tip low, very important. Casting accuracy, we always talk about it, very important. Your tackle selection, very light tips like on these St. Croix Trout Series rods, but plenty of backbone in the middle so you can get fish out of the current. Consider carrying a rod that has nanofill on it and an, or some other sort of super line and a fluorocarbon or monofilament for a little bit softer presentation, a little bit more subtle presentation. Get yourself a good fish friendly net so you can handle your fish carefully. A great set of waders and boots, so important so you can stay warm as well. Check out Hodgman for that. The most important thing is three fundamental presentations. Whether you look at the inline spinner for the real flat water or stained water, you look at the hard plug for deeper stuff or when you're really looking for maybe some big trout or striking a lot of bites. And then the most versatile of all, the little jig right here. Some sort of a little jig, the tube jig, the creature jig, or potentially the marabou jig. Learn to present those baits, read the water, get yourself some good glasses, you'll catch tons of trout. Guys, I promise you, it doesn't matter where you trout fish, it will work, it's worked for us everywhere we go. So we appreciate you watching very much. Uh, we hopefully you'll tune in and see what we're up to next week when we try to bring you some more angling knowledge that'll help you catch fish wherever you live. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Time now for today's best catch, brought to you by Berkeley. Well, that was a perfect throw and, uh, and I think this fish is a, a good size. Okay. <laughs> Need an excuse for an inline spinner? I got you one. <laughs> Berkeley, catch more fish. All right, guys, before we get going, no, 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 one, two, three. Ah, shouldn't have tried that. Fish, no, snag. Fish, oh, I had him. Okay, guys, so here's the deal. We are in big, or in, uh, let me try this again. So here's the deal, folks, we are in, no. Dude, I am not combobulated. Okay, cut for a sec, cut for a sec, okay, cut for a sec, cut for a second, okay, cut for a second.